Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome to the EPIC 7601 overclocking update video. So in the previous video I was testing the 32 core AMD EPIC server CPU for overclocking, which is actually possible. I managed to overclock the CPU to 3.8 gigahertz across all 32 cores using a core voltage of around 1.35 volt in idle, which results in about 1.25 volt under load. And the problem was that I could not go higher because of the overcurrent protection of the motherboard VRM, which I was not able to disable. Same as in the previous video, I was using the same test platform. So the Supermicro server motherboard, I was using eight DIMMs from Crucial rated 2,666 MHz, dual ranked and also a Seasonic 850 watt prime platinum PSU. And the whole system was again cooled by a chiller, mainly to just keep the CPU cold, make sure we have no limits on the CPU. So as I said before in the previous video, we could not push the CPU further because of the OCP of the mainboard, which we were able to finally disable using the Elmore EVC. Elmore EVC is an I2C um, device which we can attach directly to any kind of VRM controller that uses an I2C bus. And for example, I used this for RX 480 overclocking like two years ago, if I remember correctly. Just check out this video if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Elmore EVC is a device, um, it's actually quite cheap and it's a lot you can do with this device. Also SPD flashing, BIOS flashing. From what I know, the EVC2 will be available by the end of the year. Once it's available, of course, um, I will feature it on the channel. We'll let you guys know because it's really, it's such a useful device. And we connected this device directly over the I2C bus to the motherboard. And actually there's a three pin header on the right side located of the VRM where we can directly connect the EVC without doing any kind of um, modifications to the mainboard. And then we can just use the software of the EVC, we can click on the drop down menu, then we select the VRM controller that's located on the board, and then we can already see the monitoring data on the right. So we can monitor the real V core, we can monitor the current flowing through the CPU, and we can uh, then monitor also the power consumption and the VRM temperature. And because we're reading directly from the VRM controller, the data is actually quite accurate. It's actually more accurate than using the current clamp on the cables of the CPU because we're just, yeah, we're just measuring the CPU power. So then on the left side in the EVC software, we can easily adjust the CPU core voltage. So we adjust it to 1.45 volt, which is needed to push the CPU above 4 gigahertz and uh, on the bottom of the software we can easily disable OCP so just set it to disable and click apply and this, um, the OCP of the mainboard is gone and if we now run Cinebench at 4 gigahertz you can see the monitoring data the CPU is drawing 500 watts so yeah that's actually quite impressive um, the power consumption I would assume that if we yeah, overclock the 2990X 32 core uh, Threadripper CPU, the Threadripper 2. It should be around the same region. So it will again be really interesting to see how the mainboards can cope with this power consumption. And if you follow the monitoring data in EVC, you could also see that the VRM temperature was ramping up to 91 degrees Celsius. And then you have to keep in mind that Cinebench run yeah, at 4 gigahertz with the 32 core CPU is actually really fast. So 91 degrees, it's really on the limit for the VRM. So I decided to try some 3M Novak on the VRM. So it's Novak 7000, which has a boiling point of 34 degrees Celsius. So basically you just pour it on there. I know it's quite warm now in Europe. So we have around 30 degrees, even while shooting this video now, 30 degrees, it's really, yeah, it's quite exhausting. But um, so we can pour the 34 degree Novak on the VRMs directly because this stuff is not conductive has a very low boiling point and then if we run the Cinebench again we could see that the temperature would only hit around 50 to maximum 60 degrees Celsius which is then totally fine for the VRM. So after applying 1.45 volt to the CPU also putting Novak on the VRMs disabling the OCP we could then push the CPU to 4050 megahertz in Cinebench R15. We performed several runs also during the run, we checked if the, um, the core clock is stable. So right click in CPU C, you can see that the core clock is stable at all times because some guys said that it might not be stable all the time, but you can already judge by the score 
it's very consistent. It's always around 6,100 points. So it, there is no fluctuation in there, at least no huge fluctuation. So we can be sure that the clock is always applied to the CPU, to all cores. And 6,000 points, I would say that's actually quite impressive. Then I also performed a Cinebench single threaded test, which was on the first run 163 points, second run 166 points. Keep in mind, this is all done with Octa channel 2660 hex megahertz. So obviously, if we use a Threadripper 2, which will be able to clock higher, especially with XFR2, and then we will also be able to use higher memory frequency, probably 3000, I don't know, 3200 megahertz, then the single threaded performance should be higher, probably in the region of 170 to 180 points in single threaded, which should be quite nice even for gaming. We also performed a Prime 95 stability test at 3.5 GHz. We couldn't really do 4 GHz because, as I said before, the VRM is really running on the limit. It's fine for a short Cinebench run, but constantly drawing like 500 watts across the six phase uh, VRM that's really not made for it is probably not going to work. So we had to lower the CPU frequency to 3.5 uh, GHz with 1.25 volt um, applied, so it's 1.2 under load measured. So then we are drawing something between 200 and 250 watt from the CPU, which is a lot easier for the VRM. I kept running the Prime95 for around five minutes. Don't be fooled by the clock in Task Manager, which is showing 2.8 gigahertz, but that's only because Task Manager is only um, measuring the P0 state once you power up your system and then you change it and it doesn't um, measure the change anymore. So don't be fooled by Task Manager Clock readout always follow CPU-Z, do right click in CPU-Z, check it across all cores. So now the only question that remains is how big is going to be the performance difference from EPIC to Threadripper 2 comparing Octa channel on EPIC and Quad channel on Threadripper 2. So let's quickly have a look at this picture which is showing the Super Micro board. You can see four DIMM slots on top and four DIMM slots on the bottom, as I said before EPIC has octa channel so we can utilize all eight memory channels. Threadripper 2 will of course only use quad channel. So in the last video I only performed the quad channel testing for one configuration. So I got a lot of requests from people asking how the performance is if we test different memory slots. So we tested all possible configurations for quad channel. If we take a look at this picture, you can see the CPU in the middle, you can see the dice 1 to 4, and we can see the memory channels A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And you can also see that, for example, A, B are attached directly to die 1, C, D are attached directly to die 2, E, F are directly attached to, to 3, and G and H are directly attached to die 4. On Threadripper 1, we had the configuration that we had dice 1 and 3 active and we had the channels AB and EF populated and directly connected to the dice. And it should be exactly the same configuration again on Threadripper 2. At least I do not see a reason why it would be different. And we tested all kind of configurations. So for example, we tested AB, EF. We also tested AB, GH. So let's take a look at the testing data. Since we saw some significant changes from going from octa channel to quad channel in ADA64 read, so the octa channel configuration resulted in around 155 gigabyte per second read, write and copy, which is really a lot. And if we did the whatever quad channel configuration, we always resulted in around 60 to 65 gigabyte per second in read, write, copy. So the question was, if the difference is so big, in just the read-write copy test in ADA64, how big is the real-world difference if we do Cine Cinebench R15 testing, for example? So the top chart shows ADA64 read bandwidth versus Cinebench R15. It was performed at a core frequency of 3800 MHz across all 32 cores with quad-channel configuration of four DIMMs with 2666 MHz dual ranked as I said before. So on the left side you can see Cinebench score, on the right side you can see the bandwidth in megabyte per second of ADA64 read. On the bottom of the top chart you can see the channel configuration, so for example bottom 4 would be ABCD, out of 4 would be ABGH and so on. 
So of course we always have a certain fluctuation running Cinebench which you can also see in this chart but the fluctuation is really low so it's always something between 5700 and 5800 which can be considered measurement tolerance and if we take a look at the left 2 plus 2 which is ABEF which we think is going to be the configuration for Threadripper 2. You can see there is no difference, especially if we compare that to Octa Channel. Octa Channel full out results in around 5,790 points. And then if we take a look at this point, and it's 5,760 points, even though the read bandwidth is only 65 gigabyte per second, roughly. Yeah, um, you can see that there is almost no difference in real world performance compared to the read bandwidth. Then we saw something really interesting when we took a closer look at the ADA64 latency. So bottom part of the chart you can see ADA64 latency versus Cinebench R15. So again left side you have the Cinebench points which is the orange line. Right side you have latency in nanoseconds which is the blue line. So if we check configuration bottom 4 out 4 left 2 plus 2 we always had a latency of around 86 nan nanoseconds. If we then check top 4, inner 4 and right 2 plus 2, we always had a latency of around 135 nanoseconds. And then if we take a look at the Cinebench score, you can see we have the typical fluctuation in points. There is not really a difference. So we thought, how is it possible that there is such a huge change in latency, but there is no change in real world performance. Then we figured out that this difference is only due to software, so it's only ADA64 related. So whenever we populate the slots A and B, which are directly connected to die 1, the latency is really low. But whenever we populate the other slots and not A and B, the latency is really high. And that's just because the latency has to do another hop across one more die. So yeah, ADA64 is just requesting the test from die 1 and whenever there is no direct memory connected to it, latency is higher, which means it's just related to software, but real world performance latency is always the same across all dice. So the conclusion would be that the influence on the read bandwidth is really high if we do ADA64 testing. So octa channel, it's always around 155 uh, gigabyte per second. If we do quad channel, it's around 65 gigabyte per second. But it seems like the real world performance is not really affected by it. Um, so as I said before, if we compare Cinebench R15, we had around 5,790 points running Cinebench R15 with Octa Channel. If we run it with Quad Channel, it's yeah 40 points less. So real world performance seems not to be really affected by it, which is really good news. So it means that we can use Threadripper 2 Infinity Fabric will work really well. It will be able to use four cores on the whole package only two dies will have direct access to memory but it seems like infinity fabric is designed well enough so there is no big influence on real, real world performance if two dies have not have no direct memory access so much about this video for today we will try to do some more stuff with two epic cpus see if this will work out if everything worked out the video will be online next weekend so enjoy the rest of your weekend and see you soon